What is up, theology nerds? This is Trip, and today on the podcast, returning is Kester Bruin, uh, and he has a brand new book, Godlike. That is right, and it is quite a fun conversation because who doesn't want to talk about artificial intelligence and the need for the return of theology and in community uh, in our technological and increasingly secular age? Now, 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 before we hop into this episode, I want to tell you two things. Number one, if you want to nerd out with your geek out in person this fall, October 17th and 19th, then come on out to Theology Beer Camp. You'll be able to join me. 20 plus different scholars, friends like Ilya Dilio, uh, Brian McLaren, Diana Butler, Bast, John Tatomino, Jorg Rieger, Grace G. Sun Kim, a lot of the fun people that nerd out right here on the podcast, but in the flesh, in the person, plus 20 plus God Pods, other podcasts that talk about the divine, like Rethinking Faith Bible for Normal People. You have permission, the new evangelicals. You see what I'm talking about? Rev Covery. There's so many of our podcasting friends that are going to be in the house. So head over to theologybeer.camp and consider coming and nerding out with us in person. And last, I want to give a big shout out to all the homebrewed community. There's been a number of you, a number of you uh, who've signed up recently. You went to homebrewedcommunity.com, signed up. You donate each month to make all of this available, possible for the people. And you get access to some fun stuff like the members only podcast feed with tons of bonus goodies excitement and things if and if you like participating in all the homebrewed classes one of the perks of being in the members only podcast feed is those all the lectures and sessions get delivered to you right there so you can listen listen on your device just like it was a podcast anyway check it out homebrewedcommunity.com and here we go kester bruin brand new book godlike so much fun to have him back on the podcast and uh, until next time, Smoochie Boochies, friends. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Trip, and back on the podcast is Kester Bruin. Uh, he's got a brand new book, Godlike, a 500 year history of artificial intelligence and myths, machines, and monsters. And uh, this time, Kester and I are talking digitally. He is not wearing a pirate costume. And Pete right. Rollins is not here in a winch outfit. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll, it would be a little more focused than people in a brewery drinking. But there's no Pete Rollins as a winch eye candy. So I hope you'll be able to just, you know, you'll just have to tolerate my face on the other end of the screen. <laughs> Those were happy memories of, of real homebrew in, in almost real Christianity in almost real America. Uh, it's <laughs> And, and Mutiny is now over 10 years old. Uh, and if, and if, if there are good pirates out there who want to read a, a decade after update, um, I wrote a, a kind of 10,000 word essay looking beyond Mutiny, uh, about, about, um, you know, how, where the book got things right, where the book got things wrong and, and where the kind of pirate spirit might be roaming now. So, um, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. But it's great. Yeah. Trip. Thank you so much. Well, you know, one of the things that um, that that comes up at the beginning of this book is uh, and it might shock people that's been familiar with your work is to be addressing technology, what human beings do with technology that um, I believe it only took you. Let's see uh, the first time you make this claim. Seven pages, Kester, to insist on the need for theology. And I just felt so rewarded. Um, but, but this, this kind of return to theology in, uh, in this book, I'd love for you to kind of introduce where that, that kind of desire came from, uh, and kind of invite people that may not have heard the other episodes of how this comes out of your larger kind of wrestling with rad the radical theology tradition. So, uh, in fact, I, I, I never kind of went away from theology. I think a, a lot of theology kind of uh, moved away from me, maybe. But uh, <laughs> so to give you, I mean, to give you a, a, a few different histories. First of all, I was my my dad uh, is still alive. He's not a serving minister, but he was a minister in the Church of England for for many years and had a really impressive kind of ministry in that way. And you know, I came to kind of critique that uh, at various points and set up a um, 
a, a kind of alternative worship community called Vox many years ago. And that was almost like our um, escape vehicle from, from kind of traditional Christianity uh, and a fantastic vehicle it was too. Um, but I never, I, I, I always just kind of composted it. I mean, I never, I never actually threw it in the trash. I just wanted to, to kind of grind things down and, and to, you know, deconstruct and reconstruct. So the theological language has always been central to the work that I've done, whether that's through the book uh, Mutiny, which is basically about how pirates have through history acted as agents of change and, um, you know, that kind of act of rebellion. And as, you know, as a real kind of theological reading of piracy in there, the next major book after that was, was Getting High, which let me tell you, if you're a high school teacher and you release a book called Getting High, it can complicate your life slightly. Um, <laughs> but, but Getting High, uh, the, the students obviously loved it, but that was like a, a history of the human quest for flight. And it kind of, it, it weaves, uh, the story of the, uh, LSD counterculture with the Apollo space missions with the kind of deep history of why it is we wanted to get up there. Like why, you know, and obviously the opposite, the fall and why we want to get up back up there and that kind of whole human history of the desire for return to go up there. Uh, and it, you know, intermingled with that was some kind of personal history about my own kind of ups and downs and, and that kind of stuff. Um, now, the reason why the book is called Godlike, so I, I wrote a novel in, in the meantime, by the way, which is, which is fantastic. It's called Middle Class. Um, and it's kind of about my experiences as a teacher, uh, but it's fiction. But I then wrote this book called, uh, Godlike. Um, and the reason it's called Godlike is because the UK government's own lead on AI safety wrote a piece for the Financial Times where he talked about this godlike technology of, of AI. And I was immediately like, whoa, hold on a minute. You know, which God do you think it's like? I, what, what do you mean by that? Because clearly you are not a theologian. I mean, the guy's like a, like a venture capitalist. So I'm like, well, okay. You know, when people talk about AI becoming more human, but well, which kind of humans? And they talk about it becoming godlike. And I'm like, which kind of God? Um, so it kind of really got my theological juices going again in the sense that I think we are majorly at risk of losing theological language, by which I mean language that allows us to talk together about things that are greater than us. Uh, and I don't just mean like the other of love your neighbor and, you know, the people who are in our local community. I mean, like the big other, which I'm sure listeners of this particular podcast will be familiar with that idea. But those systems that are just kind of enormous and outside of us. And for me, when Ian Hogarth, UK government's AI safety lead, talks about it being godlike, what, what I say, take from that is, yeah, this is a system which is bigger than all of us. And that means that our human response has got to have a kind of theological angle to it. And the, the danger is, is that because we lose so much of that theological language, because everyone's scared about theology, like, oh my God, you know, what if we, what if they're talking about religion and blah, 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 you know, that, that, that really leaves us at great risk. So the book is hundred percent a theological work because it's hundred percent. I believe that AI, A, has a very, very deep history in the past about where it comes from in the human heart. But also I think that it's got a very, very theological future and that it's going to have impact beyond the kind of sense of self or local community. Um, so yeah, a lot of books on AI kind of look to the future. Mine looks as far back into the past as I can go to work out where the hell in the human heart this came from, you know? Yeah. You, you know, one of the things that um, I, I really, really liked about the book is that it's, it's kind of a practical, radical theology. It shows just how the radical theological tradition uh, takes um, the, the the depth dimension of what used to be shared in the West in Christendom uh, seriously, uh, but without taking any particular contingent or culturally embedded form of it uh, as final. Um, I, I it made me think, and part of this is because I've been. Uh, going back through all the old episodes and moving them onto one server so they can all exist yeah. again. Uh, a conversation with you and Jack Caputo uh, that we had. 
And and when you raise the question about, about theology after the big other, um, one of the things that popped up in that conversation is the uh, kind of the the cultural laryngitis that develops when the only space to talk about something that's bigger than you, that also is somehow entangled with the things we project upon it consciously and unconsciously, like what happens in a culture where that's gone, um, it gets uh, put in a cul-de-sac called religion, and there's different yep. churches and mosques and synagogues in it. Uh, but what what has always stuck out to me is the way the radical theological tradition, or Paul Tillich does this as well, and things as yeah, religion became a thing, uh, but culture has always been the place that we cultivated the poetics necessary to raise the yeah. big questions from the depth. And using both that like theological lens and right, this story where someone trying to describe professionally what's going on has to go grab uh, for the God to put words on it, yeah. uh, I, I think really sets up for why the both the historical retrieval in the book of what you're doing and the kind of constructive uh, offerings for the present are a deeply practical theology that doesn't um, necessitate being a part of a single confessional religious cul-de-sac. Yeah, I'd really appreciate you picking up on that because that's something that's been very, very dear to me. For me, the, the Radical Theology Project was never about you know, uh, reimagining Christianity or, 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 you know, having, having a kind of youth service or whatever, some of those kind of things about, um, it was always meant to be a practical outworking for how does one live one's life, uh, in a sense, you know, beyond that confessional space. Now for me, I know, you know, we could, we could, I kind of, you know, joke about the theology of it, but, but, you know, I feel more Christian now than I ever have done. And the, the reason for that is because for me, the radical theology gave me a form of Christianity that actually took seriously what you might call the Eucharist or the mass, where it's like, you know, we break God down and, you know, we are the body of Christ because God, God's this and we got to do it, you know? And, and that is, I think, also very, very true in terms of applying that to this kind of AI space where we can see it as this grand power that we have no, uh, you know, we just have to have to sort of obey what it says and all the rest of it. And that's absolute crap. Like every single AI has been built by a human. There are human decisions, every single, in every single turn in design, the development, deployment, and the decommissioning, you know? So in all of that space, you know, we've got to make sure that we take our agency into that space and, and become more human in that rather than, you know, just kind of abdicate to become more machine-like. Now, that's a very much a religious thing. Like, we're not kind of becoming, abdicating our responsibility, becoming more religious-like, like, oh, you know, I'm just going to follow whatever the priest says. Radical theology and response to AI demands that we become more human. And that, I think, is the most Christian thing that we can do. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, and the, it is, uh, it, it really raises the kind of questions in a religious context, especially in times of in, in with, where a religion's culture dominant, uh, it raises the kinds of questions the prophet does where, right, where there you have where the people have a kind of fidelity to a God that deserves to die because idols demand sacrifice. And one yeah. of the things that you give so much texture to in framing the moment, looking historically is the way our depictions of ultimacy, mystery, and power uh, get rendered in our material relations, and what happens when there's some overlord uh, that that just holds these values as natural and final? It has consequences, yeah. and we and the the idea when you give the history that we've somehow evolved. To be so rational and good uh, that that we don't need uh, the commands and demands of attending to the broken material lives of people around us to understand what wholeness looks like is just kind of a a, a hubris uh, a, a hubris of like it, it's to me it's like that scene 
uh, where Nathan says to David, you are the man, right? Where it's like, you're the one I'm talking about and you don't get it. I think part of what goes on in the kind of optimism around the intersection of technology in the markets is it, 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 it acts as if those aren't the very divine like engines rendering uh, life for an increasing number of people and non-human neighbors. Um, yeah, it's difficult. absolutely. Um, and, and it's probably probably useful to, to give people some context. And if you've heard me speak on here before, that would be some years ago. And I spent a long time in education. I was, I was teaching mathematics, as we call it in the UK. Uh, to kind of people aged 11 to 18. And I, and I quit that a little while ago and I'm now head of communications for a research charity called the Institute for the Future of Work, which is focused on exploring how AI and automation is impacting the labor market with a focus, particularly on those who are most vulnerable to that. So, you know, the book is also written out of a, of a, of some professional experience of having, having worked in the AI space for some time. And our co-founder is a Nobel Prize winning economist um, who is kind of, you know, super interesting guy um, looking at how labor markets function, how they don't function particularly smoothly and looking particularly at how AI is disrupting people's work, but also it's disrupting people's quality of life and well-being. And I think those things are, are, are super important. So, you know, one of the passions that's come through the book is from that kind of practical research base of like, how do we allow innovation and social good to go together. You know, how do we, you know, this thing is being let out amongst us. Like I, I'm, I'm not a Luddite, uh, although actually, uh, Luddites were, uh, have been, had poor press in the, the people who accused them of smashing up the machines were the kind of people who own the machines. Like that's the only story you get. What they were was not anti-machines. They were pro people. And they saw that the, the kind of automation of society would have profound impacts on communities. So yeah, maybe I am a Luddite in the true sense. I'm not anti-technology. I'm saying I'm very, very pro people. And we have to make those decisions about, um, you know, how are these new technologies going to affect, as you say, like the interpersonal stuff, because guess what? With social media, we got it really badly wrong. Like it, 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 really? it is not gone particularly well. Really, <laughs> Kessler? I, I, yeah. Uh, it, it, it to, is to flourishing. It sold us great. It sold us some great things about our autonomy and freedom and, the, and democratizing communication. But it's really, really had rampant you know, effects that we just haven't evolved quickly enough to be able to deal with. Mm-hmm. So, thinking about um, the the uh, that kind of ethical frame for people that uh, may have a shared framework right Sh- some shared deep values with the kinds of things that uh, that you do but haven't had the access time reflection on the uh, the way ai is actually all already so embedded uh in our life uh can you can you give a couple of examples uh that that it becomes something more than how do we make sure kids don't cheat or it helped me fix my grammar or those kind of things what are the what's the ethical dimension that's already having consequences? Well, first of all, what we ought to clarify, as I do at the beginning of the book, is that AI doesn't mean anything because it means everything. I mean, it's just, it's one of these coverall terms. And, you know, when, when I I promise you, I I help run in the UK parliament, the all party parliamentary group on the future of work. And there is no point sitting down with, with MPs and people in the House of Lords and trying to get them to agree on a definition of AI because there ain't one. It's just a lot of different tools that come under the same umbrella of technologies that are driven by kind of, you know, massive amounts of data. And I'll just say, you know, in terms of the history of AI, it's an incredibly simple idea. It really is an incredibly simple idea. It's just that it's only taken a particular confluence of technologies to make that possible. And you need enormous amounts of data and you need a lot of computing power and you need a way of kind of like looking at the probability structures of, we know, what word might come next. And then you kind of use it to, to predict that. So for generative language AI systems, um, you know, chat GTP, uh, is a, sorry, 
chat GPT is a generative pre-trained transformer, which means that it's been trained on a vast data set of words like Wikipedia, like Reddit posts, and then it kind of generates stuff based on what's called uh, this kind of back propagation algorithm, which is what language does. When I am thinking of the next word to put into this sentence, I'm holding in memory the words that have come before in the sentence, and I'm kind of holding in a space the words, the kind of meaning I'm aiming towards, and and I kind of choose the ne- next word. And what generative AI is doing is, is doing that in a probabilistic way. Now, that works for, hey, write me an essay about Trip Fuller in the style of Groucho Marx. It, it can do some of that stuff. That's your generative AI in that. But there's also other systems that are looking at things and trying to work out patterns. So that would be, you know, on your phone. Um, when you're taking a photo, it is using AI tools in order to be able to, you know, do stuff with photos to, to predict, uh, to predict traffic, those sorts of things. As the, um, great founder of AI systems, Marv Minsky once said, they call it AI until it disappears. And that's the thing. Most AI systems have just completely disappeared. They disappear inside our phones. They disappear inside our banking and disappear inside, you know, all kinds of other systems where algorithmically things are happening. Your social media feed, you know, there's AI going on there where it's kind of looking at your, at your, uh, at what to post next and where the ads are. That's all algorithmic. It's all AI. So what does that mean in terms of your day to day life? It means that a lot of your digital reality is being mediated and presented to you. And the question then has to be, hold on a minute, who's, who's creating the weightings by which that reality is presented to me? And there are some fantastic things about that in that it, you know, presents things to you that you might be more interested in. There's some seriously problematic things about that. So at a, at a kind of high level conference I was at about a year ago, um, the head of LinkedIn in the UK had to admit that the algorithm that it used for showing people jobs was not showing jobs to people who uh, were from migrant backgrounds, from different racial backgrounds. Now, he would say, oh, it's because, you know, they wouldn't be so interested in their jobs. No, 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 no. Hold on a minute. You know, you are constructing a reality of what, what, what jobs are available in the market to different people according to different factors. That is a pretty powerful reality transformation that that certain tiny groups of people have control of and we need to be aware of that now that for me is a religious sphere you know this generation of a particular sense of reality and a construct using language using other kind of tools uh to 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 kind of create a reality space for people is a religious space and we need that theological language to be able uh, to critique that yeah, the, 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 there's a, a piece of AI right there at the end that is deeply theological, and it's how it connects to human desire. Um, and, and, and this isn't even a radical idea. This is, like, if you just ask Augustine what the point of the church was, he says it's to learn to orient our desires towards the yeah. good. Um, yeah. And the good, obviously, for him as a good uh, Neoplatonist of sorts is God. But um, they, that that what is the purpose and function of the community of gathering with the people you live with, confessing your sins, uh, it's raising your kids and all these kinds of things? It's all connected to orienting um, one's desire and religion in some sense was a it was a cultural vessel for where you're born in the world where there are these inherited ones. One said, yeah. uh, it, some things are deeply beautiful and to be conserved and preserved and other ones to go, grow suspicion and criticism towards and grow beyond and things. But the, the, this element that you're bringing to the fore is something that the psychoanalytic tradition, I think is in, really helpful on is that there are always these parts of either collectives or individuals when desire comes out that shapes us that are conscious. Sometimes in the, in the Enlightenment, increasingly chosen, right? What part of communities you're going to be with? But there's also these pre-conscious kinds of desires, 
uh, it first explored with these biological desires that we hope we organize enough not to be, you know, ridiculous and these kinds of things. But what happens when the pre-conscious things are not even something we could cultivate uh, character to address, but they're actually activated for someone else's end, not the end of uh, of the good or love or yeah. whatnot. And like when you th- when you start to think uh, both as as someone in in the present working and thinking about the future, technology, AI, desire, and also someone who was in the classroom for years watching how teenagers were changed as they were handed uh, desire mim- mimicry machines uh, organized yeah. around anxiety, fear, and uh, tribal identity and, and things. Um, how, how, how has technology exacerbated or added fuel um, to the very place uh, theological traditions across religions uh, orient us, right? Attuning and, and, and directing our desires. So um, for those of you who read uh, Getting High, it's something that I got into in, in that book where, I mean, Getting High really is a book about technology and it's really a, a book about the, the technology of religion and the religion of technology. And, and, and I've, uh, I suppose over the last 10 years, begun to see those two things in very, very similar ways as in a fantastic book called The Religion of Technology by David Noble, which I highly recommend. Um, so my, my reading of technology and getting high is that technologies always offer us some kind of amplification. They, they fill in a weakness within us. So, uh, I personally can't push a nail into the wall with my thumb. Uh, there may be people who can do that. Um, but a hammer offers me that amplification of my strength in order to be able to do that thing. But but technologies also, because they offer that amplification, they, they come back through into the human heart and say, okay, what is your desire or in which vector do you want your desire to go to use that amplification? And it may be that you want to make a tree house or you may want to smash a window. It, so, so technology has an amplification, but it also speaks back into our heart. And the more powerful technology is, the more powerful that amplification becomes. And the more powerful, then it draws out these kind of desires that come from then really deep and surprising places. So you don't see it so much now. And I think we've begun to kind of understand the technology a bit better. Maybe we've evolved a little bit, but kind of early days of Twitter, people are kind of be tweeting stuff and it's like, whoa, you know, that, that's kind of, that's kind of racist. Oh no, it's not. I'm not a racist. I'm not a racist. Like, no, you are. That, that's the point. It, it drew out of a deeper place than you were even really conscious of, of doing that. And this is what technologies are able to do. They kind of mediate our presence in digital technologies to a vast, vast amplification that you can send a tweet out that reaches across the whole world. A podcast can, you know, reach across the world. Whereas, um, 400 years ago, you might be writing a book and that was an amazing technology for, for widening amplification, but not quite as strong amplification as other things. And people worried about books, like they might corrupt everybody. And we kind of get used to that and we'll get used to this. The point being is that that technology, what it does is allow us to amplify our strengths. However, interestingly also that what's happened, particularly with digital technologies, is that they've been sold to us as this great amplification of our abilities as a kind of augmentation of our fallen and inadequate humanity. And this, you know, you can read this right back through history as I do in the book. Um, and actually that promise is more complex than that because the reason that Facebook is free and the reason that Twitter is, you know, mostly free is that actually that promise is much more complex in that, in that the promise is that we are going to be able to know all things and access all things and search everything on Google. And actually the truth is that Google will get to know all things and then we'll sell that back to other people in terms of advertising. So there's this kind of empire structure above that, which is promising our own elevation, our own kind of salvation, perfection, augmentation. 
but actually it is using some kind of promise of that in order to empower itself. And at its worst, the kind of, uh, you know, the worst excesses of religion could be said to be doing exactly the same thing, that it's offering you this great empowerment. And actually what it's really doing is for a certain elite is empowering them. And you could look at the, the great riches of the Vatican and what have you, where other people were, were in poverty and all the money that flowed upwards into, uh, you know, kind of the, the great grandness of, of certain corrupt elements of religion and say there were similar things happening there. So the radical theology thing of critiquing that empire state of, of the way that religion can be used in that way to kind of play on our natural human desires is exactly the thing that needs to be applied into this new theological space of, of AI. And as I've said in the past in my previous work, you know, the reason why I think that Christianity is so fascinating is because it gives us a ritual and a, and a means of putting God to death. But because we are human, we keep generating those gods. Like we perform those acts of resurrection. So we keep having to find new ways to come together to put those gods to death. And it's a really good ritual to be able to keep doing that because the empire will keep presenting these great gods in order to promise us our resurrection, our augmentation, all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, there, there is a, a kind of, uh, 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 of energy that for those that have a strong, uh, like critical theological mode. Um, you're actually the most gifted at, uh, killing deities. <laughs> and, and part of that is right. Asking questions of what claims ultimacy, uh, that, yeah. that on behalf of the good justice, beauty, these kinds of things is that whatever demands that kind of allegiance, uh, should have a, an appropriate corresponding character. And, yeah, and that has been. Um, you know, it, it gets birthed in the axial period in kind of the prophetic tradition, and you can see it moving yep. throughout history. Um, now, one of the when when you decided to write this book with this retrospective uh, uh, telling, um, when did you know you're starting with Bruno? Well, Bruno comes into the book getting high. So the 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 kind of honest history of the book is that back in I think Getting High was published 2016, and there's some mentions of the kind of proto-AI in there. And I was invited to give a talk kind of focused on that tiny minor element, uh, which I was doing in kind of 2018 or so. Um, and it then struck me probably about a year ago, like, whoa, hold on a minute. <laughs> I, I haven't got deep enough into this. And... Um, just for those who are interested in the process of writing, I tend to say that I write to discover, not to reveal. Like I don't write something because I know something. I write something because I don't know something. And I, that's my way of trying to find something out. And if it helps other people to, you know, find something out too, that's great. So I felt like I didn't know enough on that, but, but I found in Giordano Bruno, who's an Italian monk who was uh, killed in, in 16, the year 1600, he was burnt at the stake. Um, I just think he's a really, really super fascinating character because the, the machine, as it were, or the device or the, the artifice that he comes up with is a technology that he claims would allow him to know all things. And because he's a monk by connection, by knowing all things, he would become like God. And this, this technology that he, comes up with, he calls a memory theater and, uh, Simon Critchley, who's professor of philosophy at the new school in New York has written a brilliant book called memory theater and Francis Yates, she wrote a book, uh, called the art of memory back in the sixties. If you're interested in, you know, the kind of history of memory culture and so on. Um, now Bruno presents that technology, uh, to the Pope and the Pope is a bit like, wow, what, you know? Um, and off Bruno goes and he kind of runs off and ends up kind of being exiled and he ends up actually in, in England. Uh, and I like to offer brand new research that has never been connected before. 
but I believe it's a, it's a connection not made before, but I, I am certain that, that, um, Christopher Marlowe, the English playwright attended one of Giordano Bruno's lectures around Oxford, which was kind of critiquing the modes of philosophy and would have heard about this memory theater and heard about this quest for great knowledge. And I think that is his prompt for rewriting his version of the Faustus myth in, in, you know, the, the play Dr. Faustus, which of course is exactly that thing. It's like, I'm going to use some kind of technology in order to access higher knowledge. And it's like a kind of chat GTP shortcut. Like I don't need to read all the books. I'll just kind of use this quick shortcut and it'll be fine. And it's not fine. Um, and the story I tell in the book is, you know, Elon Musk, 2015 was, was asked, what do you think the greatest threat is to humanity? And he goes, yeah, AI, you know, it's like the guy who summons the demon and he thinks it's going to be okay. And it's not okay. Now I think he was thinking of some like Hannah horror, crazy, uh, movie, like stranger things or something. Uh, I, I think most people think that I immediately thought of Dr. Faustus, which probably tells you something about me, but, but interestingly, which I hadn't realized when I first heard that quote was three months later, he then invests in open AI. It's like, he's playing both sides of this in a really interesting way. He realizes that this, this great demon, and I mean that in a, in a really, really proper sense. I don't mean it's demonic in an evil sense. I mean, this kind of demon technology, uh, is going to be incredibly powerful and he wants in, um, but that's proven to be a very complicated, uh, very complicated thing. So yeah, I start with Bruno because I think he introduces really beautifully this idea of the quest to know all things as being a very ancient one. And of course, later on in the book, I go back to the beginning of Genesis where, you know, go read it. I mean, uh, the serpent says, you know, you will not die. You, you will know all things and then you'll become like God. Like that is where AI comes from. It is literally right there. Right um, out of the mouth of Satan. Or a exactly. snake or what, you know. Well, Satan, snake, and as I then kind of, you know, do a bit of a play in the book, the, the language there is interesting. Lucifer, the light giver, Satan, the fallen angel, the snake. Um, all of these kind of, of these terms for this great manifestation of evil. And the point I, I really try to labor in the book is, look, this is not about some external force of great evil. These kind of empire structures, which is, I think, where you know, you're, you're kind of getting to in the kind of Babylon thing and, and you know, talking about Isaiah and, 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 and you know, kind of Lucifer and stuff. My sense is that is talking about a big empire structure that has bound people and captivated people, but it's human. It is people doing these things to people. Um, and it's incredibly important that we understand that, that, you know, open AI, Microsoft, Google, they are not, uh, God-like structures in, in the sense that they are still run by people making human decisions. And that has to give us great hope that we need to take human decisions to make sure that they work for our benefit or for the benefit of, of the, the many rather than the few. Yeah. It, I, I think the, uh, the, the ability to, uh, rotate, uh, the first two words of your title is quite ingenious you know you can tell you're a preacher's kid right that that's like setting up for a high quality sermon series god like like god no, so look, i don't know if you know this fact i am not just a preacher's kid my great great grandfather was a very famous preacher in the fair city of edinburgh Ooh. and if you had really researched your time in edinburgh you would know that when he died uh there was a two minute silence in Edinburgh. He was called the golden voice of Scotland. Um, Alexander St and, uh, he was also a bit of a bastard. He wasn't a very nice guy, but he, he preached freely in the spirit and was much troubled at home is what my granny used to say about him. Uh, like a long line of preachers, you would say. Yeah. A long line of preachers. Well, uh, maybe, maybe could, could you unpack a little bit more of, uh, how that inversion of the technological 
history that you're telling um, where our kind of growth and power of technology desire uh, to be godlike um, and, and the way theological language, mythology and reflection helps us kind of become more honest, like taking the early myth in Genesis seriously, uh, that at the heart of humanity is the temptation to become uh, like God. So, I mean, to answer that, I would probably have to begin by saying that I believe that uh, consciousness, this extraordinary miracle of human being, is also a, is also a kind of sense of trauma. Like it, it is something that we struggle to process and to understand. And and a lot of what we've done in terms of our thinking and philosophy it, are ways to try and understand. Like, hold on a minute, you know, how did this happen? And we can externalize that and say that we were given the spark of consciousness, or we can say, you know, it evolved in some other way. I, I don't really care too much about which way you go on that. What I think is more interesting is that this idea of consciousness as a sense of trauma is fascinating. What it means is, is that we are thirsty. We are thirsty to know more and to, and to understand because we understand that we don't know enough. And I think that's part of that trauma of consciousness is that, that, that thirst for more. And it's also a sense of our uh, shortcomings that consciousness gives us a sense of that. You know, I, I don't think that dogs worry about the canine condition. Uh, you know, you could say that they are a consciousness in some way, but they don't necessarily have a trauma of consciousness. They're not like, oh my God, you know, just think about being a dog. Um, they just get on with it. Whereas we don't, and that's a real great gift. And it's, it's provided a wonderful engine for so much beauty in all that we have achieved as a species. Um, but it means that we are constantly looking for ways to, you might say, return ourselves to a place of wholeness that we once believed existed. And uh, Pete would talk about this in terms of this, this kind of lack and all the rest of it. Um, but the means by which we achieve that wholeness um, and technology is really it. That's what technology does. It, it allows us to try and augment ourselves. And if you look at, you know, and an, all the things that an angel does and all the things that an iPhone does, they're kind of similar. They allow us to mediate your presence. There's instant messaging. There's this ability to kind of great, you know, have great knowledge at your fingertips. Um, these are kind of theological things. And you only need to look at when Steve Jobs was kind of doing his great uh, presentations at Apple conferences. I mean, it's like a temple, you know, it's all like pure white and everyone's dressed up like priests and you've got all the acolytes. So, um, without a doubt, I think technology is, I think forever functioned in a theological way. Uh, and, and similarly, uh, religion has, has functioned in a, in a technological way and technology has functioned in a religious way. I think those two things are really kind of interchangeable. And that's really helpful for us to understand, first of all, how to critique the religious promises that we're given about your salvation, your completeness, your, your journey to wholeness, and also the kind of religious promises that technology makes about, you know, having to keep constantly upgrade and get to the new phone and guess what? Chat GTP5 is going to do this and it's going to be perfect and it's going to be all those stuff, you know. These promises that are thrown out to us by big, powerful, elite empire structures need to be critiqued using the same theological language that we ought to be holding together in communities of trust and, uh, and kind of authenticity, which is why I'm kind of passionate about one of the things I think we need to uh, push back hard towards is gathering in person as people into places where we encounter the other, encounter people who are slightly different to us in real life spaces so that we can kind of learn that language again of, of critiquing together the structures we find ourselves living within. Mm -hmm. 
you know, when you give that example of kind of human, the distinctive elements of human consciousness, um, and I mean, there's obviously like scales of complexity when it goes to other uh, species and such. But one of the things that I think is captured in um, the, 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 the kind of like primal myth in Genesis three uh, that you play out in the history of us with technology is there's for, to be human is to always be inheriting and relating to our past. And yeah. um, that's connected in that notion of memory. And, and yet there's a surplus of it, but once your identity is so tied to memory and there's a surplus of it, it's easy to think that in possessing all of it, you possess the power. And then it goes to the other direction when it goes to the way we use technology to kind of increasingly control, manage the world is the future possibilities. And there, because we can th sit and think about future possibilities, there's the temptation to possess all the possibilities uh, through control and management and technology and these kinds of things, put more and more of the world under control. And the yeah. spaces of uncontrollability um, where the riskiness of relations and connection takes place gets continuously mediated. And yet yeah. the that deep anxiety about knowing ourselves as finite and knowing ourselves with limits uh, makes it really hard to trust existing without becoming a data junkie for the past and memory and a technological uh, seeker to possess the kinds of power you need to control the present from money to other forms of technology and symbolic yeah. communication. And, and uh, in, in a past book I wrote, called other which is you know a kind of exploration of our relationship to otherness um so that's an old book now but um book i'm really proud of i kind of get into this idea of the abyss of of personhood and and i'm i'm kind of thinking about that now and wishing i'd put this a bit more in the ai book but <laughs> you know it's it's like as if we could know every single data point about everyone, that would be enough. And it's not enough. It's not enough. So there's this, you know, thing about knowing the number of hairs on your head. And there are certainly fewer than when you last saw me on this podcast. But um but Google gathers all of this data about us and these other come gather with data as if they can then find us to be known. I just don't accept that. And I think that when we gather together as people, we gather together almost as the unknowable with one another and accepting the unknowability of the other and not trying to desperately do all that we can through kind of data points of finding out more about the person just so that we can then say, yeah, you know, these are my deep kind of knowledges about the person. It can be, it can be experiences with a person where you don't necessarily have more data about them. Um, and that's an exciting place to be. And that's, that's, I think, a much more rich way of understanding relationship. Not that you know more about the data points for person, but that you have more wisdom with that person together. Yeah. And, and I think there's this element that, um, that you get at in telling the, the history of how we, the world is be, we're creating a world where in a sense we don't want to be called right if you think of the event that uh it, yeah. at least on our best days religious tradition steward um and so when when we, because the event in many ways requires uncontrollability it requires connection and materiality and embeddedness and all the things uh that are so human and yet um, the what happens or what gets itself done in those spaces uh, is something that this seizes us. Um, we don't control it. And this this kind of continued drive to control the world uh, is like flattening the places where the depth dimension where you could resonate with, you know, hints of transcendence or wh whatever kind of language we want. But the to me that. Uh, the 
inhumanity that's being generated by us and our technology is that's a theological problem and it's hard to even find out what to find the right language for it when that language itself is already kind of suspicious in large parts of culture or put in the private cul-de-sac of what you do every once in a while on certain days um wh- what has the kind of, what what are you hoping this kind of intervention uh, generates when you think of like how AI's triggered for the last you know six months? You you even joke in the book about how many things you had to go back and update, right? And like it, this, they said this. I can't believe they helped me out finish my chapter by you know saying the <laughs> quiet part out loud and, and all this. But when you think of what the conversation that's happening right now, um, wh- what are we not discussing and what are the challenges? to um to frame it where the significance of human dignity and relations is back on the menu so there's a there's a uh, perhaps apocryphal conversation i tell in the book uh between mark minsky who i've, who I've uh, mentioned and doug engelbart who's a kind of very significant character in the history of computing and mark minsky says to him hey you know this is this ai stuff it's incredible we're we're, we're gonna we're going to do this for machines. We're going to make machines conscious. And Doug Engelbart says, yeah, well, what are you going to do for the people? And that for me is super interesting lens through which to kind of understand how we think about priorities going forward. So Doug Engelbart was interested in not AI, not an artificial intelligence, but in intelligence augmentation in IA, in which the, the human experience was uh, central and that we were kind of impacted and, and augmented by technology, but it didn't become an independent consciousness. And I think one of the interesting things about the kind of push for AI, AI is that it is really, as, as the AI pioneers would freely admit, it is a godlike um, task. They are trying to create a godlike presence amongst us. And it's, you know, if, here, here it comes, Deus Ex Machina. It's like the, the machine is being wheeled on stage, the lid is opening, and this thing is going to come out. And the question is, how are we going to live alongside this thing that is now coming amongst us? And my sense of that is, is that what we need to do is to, to come together in these kind of mid-level structure communities and find ways to be together with one another, not without technology, Come on, like we, we, we cannot exist without technology. Language is a technology, our glasses, our pencils, I mean, everything, right? We, we can't hope to be without technology, but we need to be conscious and reflective about the, the, the ways in which we agree that technology is, is serving us in terms of our human communities rather than us serving it. And that is a political decision. The politics of it, and of course, you've got an election coming up in the US and we've got one coming up around the same time in the UK. And very often it can be this very kind of like that the top level politicians up here and then the people down here and there's nothing in between. Well, that's slightly unique in history. In the, in the past, it would have been various mid-level structures whereby we would have these conversations together, whether that was in your churches, in your kind of um, you know, worker communities or, or kind of worker councils or trades unions or the bowling club or whatever it is. And my plea is that the only way we are going to flourish as human people in relation to a very powerful new technology is if we gather together in spaces whereby we learn to reflect on those tools that are amongst us and think about that very Christian ritual of how do we put this to death? How do we begin to make sure that it is serving us rather than us serving it? And how do we make sure that actually the, the greatest things about our human flourishing are there to be emphasized rather than the worst things? Now, that is not a straightforward picture. My mum, for example, is losing her eyesight. AI can generate audiobooks far more cheaply than humans reading them. 
that is a good thing for people with poor eyesight because it means they're cheaper and they're more available and that's widening access to knowledge. That's great. It is putting a certain number of people out of work. That is not great. So how do we balance these things out is not a straightforward thing. It's political. It is theological. It is about sociological stuff. And it requires us to, to wake the hell up and to be human beings. You know, we've been kind of passive receptors of technology and told you got to do this. Hey, why haven't you got a TikTok account? Like stop being so damn passive and wake up and be human. Cause if you don't, the AIs are going to become more human than we are. And that's, that's a kind of crazy place. We got to be, we got to be more human. That is the best possible thing that we can do. So at the uh, end of the, uh, towards the end of the book, you do this uh, kind of play on Ray Kurzweil um, in, in his line about it, responding to the existence of God and, uh, and, and given give an odd answer for someone who's trying to lure people back to church. Uh, but it was uh, a high quality Kester Bruin walk the aisle invitation at the end of a book, which I have to, here's my theory. People, if you're interested when you, if you've heard Kester mention other books, um, you can always go read the last chapter and see what happens when, when he preaches the sermon he needed to, uh, th- th- that he that he was able to do after doing the discovery of the book. Um, that's my theory on reading Kester Bruin books is the last chapter is uh, what happens because he spent this much time writing these books. Um, but yeah, so when it goes to th- that kind of play of Ray Kurzweil going with you to church for Christmas, um, uh, yeah, y- 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 give us that kind of so, vision. Wait, let, me, let, let me tell you. So Ray Kurzweil, who's a, you know, for those of you who are into your music, he, he, you know, made great revolutions in digital sound technology and is a, you know, super interesting guy, but he is very, very committed to becoming a digital consciousness. And there's a, there's a fantastic documentary on YouTube you can watch called Transcendent Man, where he talks about his, uh, attempts and, 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 you, you know, he's pursuing this thing, what, what, he would eventually call a Moravec transfer, whereby, you know, neural by neural is replaced by a digital, tiny digital circuit, and he will become an online consciousness. And for one thing, that'll be very expensive. So the cheap version will be like, you'll be an online consciousness, but you'll have ads the whole time. I cannot think of any worse circle of hell than suddenly uploading myself to the internet and suddenly being plagued by ads for like crazy slippers or whatever I get these days. But in that documentary, he says, People ask me, does God exist? And I say, not yet. Now, for me, there's a kind of super interesting thing here about, and the reason why I tried to talk about Christmas, uh, is that because what, what I understand is that the beauty of Christmas is that this kind of reverse play of that, in that in the incarnation, we are seeing God stepping down from godness into the human dress, as William Blake says it. And that being the most wonderful thing that could be done. So my play on Ray Kurzweil is, you know, is people saying, does God not, does God not exist? And I say, not yet. You know, like we're working towards the non-existence of God through this process of radical reincarnation of putting aside our desperate technological attempts to become godlike and instead to become more human and more open and vulnerable to one another, yes, that will be mediated by technology. I'm loving the fact that I can talk to Trip on a screen using these wonderful tools. It's not about a rejection of that, but it is about a rejection of the way that that is presented as a theological augmentation that's going to lift us upwards and my view is, no, 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 reject all of that. Use your technologies to become more human, more caring, more, uh, more loving as a, as a person. And that is the process whereby we are the body of Christ. Like, you know, we take that and we, we consume it and we share that amongst one another in a manageable sized community so that we become that godlike presence to one another. You, you have, uh, when I'm, when I'm reading books and it gets to a paragraph 
where I think to myself, I will likely lose sleep thinking about this when I'm trying to go to bed at night and just it pops up. And the one I went back to um, and and earlier today when I was talking with Brian McLaren, I read it to him and he was like, oh, I'm going to have to go, you know, get Kester's new book uh, was this wonderful. We are about to face a force of empire more aggressive, more powerful and more agile than anything in history. Backed by insane amounts of capital, it will demand the extraction of returns for its masters and will do so by attempting to occupy every area of our lives. It is already in almost every pocket, in every living room, and every workspace. It is ready, are we? That question not being resourced with the wisdom of wrestling with the divine um, seems almost beyond crippling. When you got to that, asking that kind of question and think of the, the students that you worked with who already have it in their pocket and the power of capital that demands returns for its shareholders in the companies, your nonprofits trying to provoke. Um, w- what makes you think uh, we might get ready to give some kind of response? We have to hope. And I think actually there are pockets of, of, great resistance to this. And I think people feel it in a kind of reflex way. We are very close to sleep. We're very close to that slumber, but there's still these kind of sparks of like, whoa, this, this doesn't feel right. You know, uh, now some of that has taken a violent turn and you may have seen the stories of like the, you know, the AI driverless cab in San Francisco that got kind of torched and thrown over. Um, but it has been a sense of history. And I suppose you could talk about the connecting threads in my work with the stuff on piracy. Um, but it's been a connecting thread and you can, you can go and read, uh, Walter Brueggemann and, and think about hopeful imagination, prophetic imagination, two books about resisting that royal consciousness, that empire consciousness and the ways in which a radical Christianity or a radical religion of any flavor has always sought to do that. And I think we have to hope for a return to that. But in order to, to do that, we, we do need to have an active process of waking up and technology loves to lull us into that slumber. Um, so it, it, it is, it is something that people already know. I do believe that. Um, but they just need to have that sense of spark around that or, or, a, or a taste of that meal again, we're fed off very often such bland things. And then suddenly there's like this experience and a remarkable flavor. It's like, wow, you know, I, I want more of that. I want more of that. And that's, you could call that being the salt in the world. You can do, you know, all of that, but it, it is that hopeful thing of remaining faithful to that. Now, as a father to two children, who love their phones, you know, I know the profound difficulty of doing that, but just each day, just trying to do that experience and for myself of, of, of trying to push beyond that into other spaces and other experiences and to give those flavors of different moments, I think is profoundly important because as you say, you know, the system is ready and it is more powerful and more crazily backed by capital than ever before. It is incredibly powerful. You know, we, we talk about the Promethean act of when humans stole fire from the gods and kind of grave language. And a few people around the world have done it in reverse and they have given away our most precious gift of language to machines in that reverse Promethean thing. This is why I talk about Oppenheimer and the kind of modern Prometheus and, and Frankenstein in the book as well, because this process of dealing with these kind of monstrous, huge things, we have got experience of before, 
but we need to gather all our courage because we're facing a big one. This is bigger than the nuclear threat. You know, it is bigger than some of these other threats that we faced before, simply because it's so interconnected and so kind of bound up in the web. It's going to take an enormous uh, kind of courage, a theological courage and a communal courage to be able to face it down. Mm -hmm. it, in the in different than something like nuclear threat uh, and such, the the kind of places of resistance are much nearer. We have much more agency over how we can do it. Um, you, you use language like coming to terms with the outrageous miracle of human being, um, coming together in communities of human flourishing with our curious, bloody messes of flesh, celebrating our one wild and precious life, doing less for machines and more for people. Um, that kind of uh invitation requires uh that kind of fabric of physical connection as someone whose family was deeply embedded in the church in england and apparently in scotland um and someone who early on like in your your, your book on emergence and early part of the emerging church movement and the alternative worship movement and then thinking in radical theology and all these kinds of things. When you look at this, like the changing shape of uh, embodied communities nested in value and the the growth of culture beyond religion, like what are your hopes for kind of ecclesial bodies that celebrate the materiality of life? And it's bloody messness. Like what, what has that looked like for you uh, and uh, personally, but also just like when you dream of what that could be, um, wh where, what does so, that look like now? So one of the, one of the works I talk about a fair bit towards the end of the book is, is uh, a book called Bowling Alone, which was a study released in the year 2000, which kind of tracked people's lives together at that kind of mid, mid level. And, you know, how those after the 1950s and with the, with the kind of advent of mass television, people spend, you know, more people go temp and bowling now than ever in the States, but fewer people than ever bowl in a bowling league. And, it, you know, the, the guy uses that as a kind of interesting stat to say, whoa, you know, people are doing things in its atomized way that they used to do together. And why is that? And what has kind of broken that apart? Now, part of that is a, is a good thing because some of those communities were built around exclusion. They were built around places of privilege and power, whether that's the kind of country club culture or the kind of golf club, you know, that doesn't allow certain people in or whatever. So I think there's been a good deconstruction of some of that, but that was never going to be a deconstruction that then meant the place to remain was just all atomized and doing all this kind of stuff on her own. So for me, I guess my theological journey from someone brought up in a church that was steeped in some of those power structures into a total deconstruction of that. And then to say, yeah, what we need to do is gather around together, but not gather around an actually existing presence, but gather around a loss, gather around that death of God. And that is the most faithful Christianity for me. But similarly, I think it is the most faithful way that, you know, someone like Shizek or, or Critchley would talk about, you know, the original uh, Soviet, you know, in, the, in, the, in that kind of pure ideal of the of the Russian revolution where people were kind of gathered in these kind of small working groups and it never worked. Of course it never worked because it, it fails to take account of so many elements of humanity. And of course, churches need to be thoughtful about how they have to keep putting to, putting to death that God. But my hope is that people will, having experienced these decades of atomization, understand that a sense of grouping back together is profound and important. Um, and I think there's an enormous thirst 
I don't want to say nostalgia because I don't think it should be about something going backwards, but it should be about something going forwards whereby we learn to gather again. But I can tell you now that will be hard and it will be actively resisted by every algorithm that you have because it, the algorithm does not want you to do that. Because gathering together like that is not productive time. It's not time where you're being, you know, data is not being harvested and you are not being advertised that, you know. So it will be resisted and it will therefore become a radical political act in order to do that. Um, but it's important that we do take those political actions and we do gather together and that we don't allow ourselves to remain atomized, which is the most passive state that we can be as humans, just kind of, you know, absorbing and, and, and uh, having stuff thrown at us and that we begun, begin again to be creative, flourishing people who kind of gather together in these groupings, not in order to abdicate our responsibility to some higher power, but to enrich our sense of power together as groups of people who can gather around that absence, that death of God. What, what do you, what do you think, um, what do you think was learned going in and out of COVID, um, about human beings and digitally mediated relations, uh, communal solidarity, the, the kinds of things that you're raising in the book, uh, have an energy to them that that I don't think we had prior to the COVID experience. I'm interested in how you've reflected on it. So, uh, one of the things I mentioned in the book is an article I wrote pre COVID with a, with a fantastic anthropologist called Trevor Marshall, who's a, a Canadian guy who lives in Britain, which was about the flattening experience of technology whereby the more that we kind of interact on screens, it kind of pushes into a flatness, the sense of our experience together. Now, I was experiencing this within a classroom setting where I was talking about teaching mathematics that was not situated in the head, in a kind of silent thinking, but was situated as most learning should be in the whole body. And I talk about looking out over these kids doing an exam and I could see them like acting out these funny little things that I'd taught them. But the memory, the memory was in the whole body, not just within the brain up here. And the problem with the flattening experience of being on screen is that because it reduces the number of senses with which we bring ourselves together, those experiences make less sense because there are fewer senses. And that means that the me, that the ways in which we uh, think about problems together also become flattened. So that when someone says, oh, you know, what about that? The first thing they do is pick up their phone. That becomes the reflex of like, I'm just going to look at the phone rather than doing some other action or, you know, attacking the problem in a kind of physical structural way. So that can lead to a, to a, a, a kind of vicious circle of we spend more time online and therefore we become more used to thinking about problems in that flatter way. And it becomes the only way in which we can kind of have that experience. So what COVID I think did was a very, very big push very suddenly in that direction. And it became quite a shock actually, uh, for somebody whose craft was, you know, in person, speaking to people, that richness of experience. And of course, it made it very clear that what I was not doing was transmitting data. You know, the learning experience was not, here is a piece of data you don't know, and now I'm going to tell it to you, and now you know it. That, that's like the minorest thing, um, that, that knowledge and understanding happen in very, very different ways, and in fact, happen far better in a in a complex dynamic of people together. And I think um, one of the hangovers from COVID has been people have misunderstood 
how much you can get from exchanging bytes of data to one another. And that that has become a, a kind of safer space of exchanging information. Whereas the process of coming together uh, to enrich our understanding and our knowledge together has become more complex. And of course, for many people, the, the school classroom and, you know, the workplace had always been a complex place where they felt uh, excluded to some, to some degree, as many churches have done that. So when this other option came up that gave that other experience, they didn't want to go back. That's not because the technology is great. It's because the ways that we were gathering together were in some way not including those other experiences. So those, are, those experiences, what we need to do desperately is to understand how can we be together in ways that are enriching for those who are quieter and those bit more on the edges and those who were finding that an anxious place to be. Because, you know, we need to make sure that we can be together in ways that are enriching for, for everybody. Because I, I genuinely believe that we do need to be in those places where we experience the other in a way that allows us to generate understanding and care and knowledge together. Mm -hmm. No, I, I think that's really helpful. And I, I don't know how the experience was uh, exactly in England, but I was in Edinburgh and then moving back to the States and seeing how it impacted people here really differently um, for whatever its uh, limits are. I think having a neighborhood based school system and local uh, chemist pharmacist, if you're an American and um, everyone being on the same insurance plan created a different kind of uh, community bonding of sorts that, uh, you know, we were we were there three years and two of it was the COVID experience. And as a family, we are closer to multiple families on our street. Uh, in Edinburgh than we were towards that many families on any of the places we've lived much longer. Yeah. Um, yes. The UK in a city is a different thing because of mass transit, walking to school and all that kind of stuff. But it was really the COVID experience where that all like where these already kind of acquaintance level relations became the only ones we are legally supposed to have. And surprisingly, yeah. the Scottish follow rules a lot better than Americans, Kester. Um, I got in trouble for going for too many walks one week. Uh, but the, uh, the, but it did set up for a real intimacy where like we, uh, my wife and daughter flew back for our neighbor's 50th birthday, Kaylee. And uh, because it was her, my daughter's best friend and her and her birthday. And like, we couldn't imagine not being there, but it's in August during the festival, Fringe Festival, where it's impossible to get to Scotland then. So it's like only two of us can go. And then they're like sending the video thing. And I realized, but in that, uh, talking to my neighbors here, that was not the experience um, where every bit of it got political. And then they were sitting in that very flattened screen experience where there's algorithmic tribal identities getting ramped up. Uh, and yeah. now there's like this new level of animosity. Um, can, I, can I tell you where, where I uh, think just picking up on, on two words that really frame that well for me, and that's mass transit. Mm -hmm. so I, I kind of play on this a little bit at the end of the book. My, my sense is that car culture gives us some sense of some of the risks, challenges, and opportunities of AI culture as well. So a car does some extraordinary things. It allows you to break down geographies, which is a, a democratizing experience. It allows people to go to workplaces that they might not have been able to reach before. But it's also a very atomizing experience. And it's one that gives us, as I've talked about, that sense of amplification of a technology. All cars are overpowered. I mean, like, no one needs this. Every single car out there is able to go faster than the speed limit of any country I know. I mean, this is just like, they are overpowered. Um, but that gives us a sense of excess power within ourselves, which can boil over into aggression. And we're kind of in these places. And let's face it, like, 
it's it, it's not working. Like we're in traffic jams, it's all congested, all the rest of it. Um, and I think that AI is very possibly going to do that same thing. Like you'll have your algorithm that's kind of like out there battling for you and trying to kind of push yourself into a market and up your podcast stats and push you further on social media. And there'll be great gains in, again, breaking down geographies of personhood about you'll be able to apply for a job in Mumbai. And that's, that's fine. You know, that's great. And you'll be able to do all these kind of things. But the risks are the ways that it will separate us and that the excess of power that it will offer will create aggressions that then will play out when you see something like COVID where people are no longer able to come together in their physical small presences. And therefore, they kind of play out these kind of excesses of power in really quite problematic ways. Now, just in a very simple way, in a mass transit city, you just kind of got to get on with it. You know, there's a sense in which it's frustrating, but everyone's in there and, you know, it, it, it kind of works for different people and the flows of people go around and you, you know, it, 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 as Jane Jacobs, your wonderful American writer, the, the death and life of great American cities, you know, she's the one who put me onto this, that it's when you get out of the car and walk the pavement. That's how you reduce crime. Your eyes are on the street. You kind of notice your neighbors. You talk to one another. That's community. You get into your car, you're closed off from that. Now, car culture is one thing that the point I'm making is that we risk doubling down on that in an AI culture, which is going to separate us even further. And we have to guard already and think about how we're going to respond by how we're going to ensure that we shore up those places of, of engagement with the other in ways that our excess power just can't work like that. We need to, we need to love and care for one another and kind of speak to each other on that kind of physical, um, yeah, street level way. Mm -hmm. that, that's, that's really helpful because the, that challenge of atomizing both when you think of, uh, Robert Putnam's work and bowling alone and, yeah. Um, what was the book he did after that on religion? Uh, yeah. Whenever I it was, I, I interviewed his co-author about it a long time ago. And I just remember it, it making a lot of the same points, but hitting home in a different way as clergy. Um, uh, and, and, and the way the technology stuff plays, I'm, I, I have a personal predicament about the podcast. I'm interested in, in what you think. So like I'll survey regular listeners and members and such. Um, tomorrow's the 16th anniversary of homebrewed Christianity. Amazing. And the, you know, for years, I would feel great if 500 people listened. Uh, but like this conversation, you know, 40, 50,000 people will listen to it or watch it or, you know, the, engage it in some way. Um, I'll make books. I'm joking. Yeah. Uh, well, you can get them all. Uh, the, the, um, about, whenever it was Pete and I first did the atheism for Lent thing online. And then I've kept doing classes and each year I'll do about six now, and there'll be two to 4,000 people in each one for four to six weeks. Uh, and this kind of thing. Uh, and the numbers of people that join the class, listen to the podcast, uh, are members of the homebrewed community. Um, and go to the big event in person event each year, theology beer camp have grown. Um, and, the other thing that's happened in the survey stuff is a percentage of people that have a faith community they participate in and aren't paid to be there has gone down dramatically. Yeah. And now that's one thing if it's culture, like at large, when it's someone hearing me ask this question after an hour and 20 minutes of me and you having a conversation about technology where some familiarity with radical theology, uh, what's going on in the discussions in culture of technology, uh, enough literature references that you didn't feel like we were, you know, talking down to you to have to, by explaining it. You want us just to like mention it and go like the number of people that fit in that category where you each week listen to two hours of a theologian, philosopher, minister talking to nerdy people that. Yeah. I mean, most of the time when we preached, we didn't get a high percentage of people to pay attention to that part, right? And yep. yet they're engaged in that way, but don't have the community element. 
but those those the online community parts grown a lot in the yeah. pop up classes. The like right after COVID, we had 250 people at beer camp, which was bigger than before. Then the next year, 450, and it sold out. And then this year, it's like, how do you find a church that lets you day drink? It's open and affirming, and has more space for multiple stages. Like you, the, the limits could you know be a lot about finding the right space and and things like that. Um, so the the kind of interactive community space digitally and at the events have grown, but the number of them that have any of that kind of space in their life has gone down. And I wonder both for someone that what kind of encouragement or reflection for people stewarding things like that would you have, but also for people listening who haven't been able to find those kinds of spaces and probably were harmed or told to shut up or have real trauma connected to what happened there, right? Like, what what are those what are the kind of generative steps you could imagine uh knowing what the technology facilitates that's good and ill and and that's the thing the technology is wonderful and it allows us to uh communicate in extraordinary ways and we are multimodal communicators so that's incredible the ways that we can do that communication so someone could read a transcript of this and get the same meaning uh, that's that's incredible that's absolutely incredible that we could do that uh you know animals can communicate in generally a single mode but they can't do that multi or other animals multimodal thing so that's extraordinary but it's it's important to note that that's not the full human complexity so i think there's been a period where people have needed the online community in order to resource themselves out of spaces which were not good for them. And there's a healthy sense of grief about that. And there's a healthy sense of having to go away from those spaces. But then there's also a healthy sense of, yeah, online is fantastic, but it's never going to be enough to provide that complexity. So what do I then do? You know, and how do you then start to crystallize around those spaces? And part of that I have to say, there's got to be about some, again, theological courage for those who do have that sense of leadership, but are not in that traditional space or have been paid in that traditional space and are, you know, wanting to find another way to be in that is to it's like fess up, you know, okay, we're going to create a, a different kind of space on a different kind of economic model uh, and, and we'll start to gather around that. Those things don't need also to be like the most highly arty creative. Oh my God, we've got to have a billion tea lights and a virtual reality presentation. Yeah, it was fun doing that stuff, but my God, you can't do that every week or every month at all. You know, you simply need to gather, but you need to gather around complexity and you need to gather around uh, different dimensions so that it's not always that same dimension. And that, is where the problem starts because because it can be gathering around just that one dimension, then it just becomes about that one thing. But when you start to gather around complex things, different leaders emerge, you know, because the person who's really good at the getting people gardening or going on kind of walks through nature or the city is not the same person who's really good at leading a book group or or whatever. But but crystallize those relationships of trust and begin to kind of think about where you could meet locally in order to do that. I guarantee there are people, you know, if there's a church that you were going to, there will be people who are no longer in that church who are interested in doing something else. And for me, the, the you know, radical theology has totally failed unless it offers those different political, social, economic spaces outside of that thing that's informed by the rich complex, fascinating philosophy, theology of, of, you know, death of God's theologies, whatever it is. Uh, if it's only about that single dimension of the, the kind of religious aspect, I'm not interested. It's totally failed. Yeah. Well, uh, if you thought the, uh, only invitation Kester was getting is to go back to church. Now you can go plant one. Um, 
So last question, uh, this is more of a dad question. You're doing something that I'm extremely jealous of. You are a dad roadie. So for, oh. uh, for people have heard stories about your, your, your son, uh, sons, uh, when they were young, a long time ago, we even got, had a nice excursus when you, cause you had visited and my son was also obsessed with pirates, uh, which yes. I have to admit, not all theologians that stayed at my house played with Playmobil and had unique pirate voices for multiple characters. Kester did. Um, but, but, but say a bit about that, like, the love for music and seeing it handed on and then what your what your son's up to. So it gives me a reason to put a uh, link to for people to go check it out and such because my son's band, uh, they're called Play Dead. They are a very, very traditional UK punk outfit. The songs are short. They come from a place of young poverty, not much, they've got no resources, no much, not much money. You know, they, they rehearse in my garage. They are actually a garage band. Like they literally use my garage to rehearse and, um, they're fantastic. I'll tell you quickly just about where they kind of came from. So my son, uh, is, uh, let me tell you, I'll go back one stage further because this is a great story about technology. My son is a drummer in the band, which is the most terrible instrument to have your child fall in love with because it's so loud and so big. But the reason he's a drummer is because he was playing the Wii, the old Nintendo Wii. And we had Beatles rock band because I'm a big Beatles fan. And he fell in love with the drums. That was playing a video game is now why he is uh, a punk musician about to go on a European tour. They got, you know, they played on national radio. They get great followings and the gigs are, are sweating and rough it. But when he became a musician when he was younger, uh, he was in a band aged 12 or 13 years old. 12 and 13 year old do not get to go into sweaty pubs in London and play their music. So I did the pirate thing, the Marxist thing. We took control of the means of production. And I said, look, you know, we'll put on gigs ourselves. And I found a venue that was, that was happy to do that. So every month or so we'd have two or 300 sweaty young people coming to listen to their mates, different bands, different genres. We had funk, we had hip hop, we had drum and bass, we had punk, we had rock, we had kind of soul stuff, all young bands playing on stage. And these kids in this kind of tunnel archway under a railway where there was no mobile service and no Wi Fi. And they just sweatily got on with each other and had an incredible time. That's what I mean about these crystallizing communities around something. Um, and these two young guys got up on stage with this drummer who was okay, was a bit shonky and they loved doing it, but the drum was terrible. So they kicked the drummer out and got my son, uh, to play in the band. Yeah. So they're called Play Dead and their new EP is out soon. Um, I'm very fortunate to be going over to Amsterdam, uh, to do a little radical theology book talk over there, but also to intercept my son's band. They're playing in Harlem, the original Harlem. Uh, no, not the suburb, uh, just near Amsterdam. So that's, uh, in a couple of weeks time, but yeah, go, go check out play dead, uh, songs about influencers, about crappy public transport, about having no money and about getting a terrible haircut. These are all the things that matter to our young people. Mm -hmm. so. So the, uh... But the physical space of punk, I think is lovely. You know, it is, uh, it is about being there in person in the mosh pit where you just kind of smash out your troubles together. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the 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 original Harlem, I uh, yeah. it, it, that was one of those things. If you're an American and then you go to live in Europe, um, we <laughs> went to York for New Year's Eve, and uh, you know they were were they're down in the middle and they're they're doing stuff, yep. and um, wh one of our kids goes, "Oh, it's kind of like what they do in New York," and you know they say it out loud, and then I like kind of, oh, <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. Exactly. I was like, except there's no way you could get uh, a, a pint of mulled wine uh, for three dollars in New York City. That's impossible. Uh, but oh, wow, that's great. This has been awesome, uh, Kester. It's wonderful to connect. Very good. Excited so about cool. the book, um, and I hope everyone goes and check it out. There'll be links here, but you can also just put Kester Bruin in uh, on the interwebs, yeah. and you can go stalk him and uh, follow 
Yeah, so go and go and kesterbruin.com where you can find out about all the writing. And then there's a blog there. So, you know, I love that sense of being able to comment, interact. And uh, and as with all my books, you know, I might be wrong. I, that, I'm not saying that I'm like, got everything right. But that's that's the point. A book is not a, an object of, that's it. This is all the correct truth. It's like a starting point for generative discussions that I hope people will have in their communities, wherever they are. So thank you so much. Awesome.